Here we go. Kellogg's, Heinz, Caterpillar, and just last month, GM are just some of the companies that have cut hundreds of good jobs in this region in the past few years. It's part of a global realignment, but that is cold comfort for those now looking to replace good middle-class jobs, replacing them often with precarious contract work. How can London regain control of its economic destiny? When companies post record profits on the backs of workers consistently refused full-time work and the job security that comes with it, people get defeated. And when governments serve special interests instead of the interests of the citizens who elected them, people lose faith. We've probably heard precarious work being referred to by corporate leaders and political leaders. It's presented as, well, this is the new normal, um, get with the program, people should just uh, get used to this and, and, and adapt. Ontario, full-time permanent jobs with benefits used to be the standard employment model. But today, about 50% of Londoners are in non-standard work. These are often precarious jobs which are vulnerable and unpredictable. Lower wages, a lack of benefits, job insecurity, and dangerous working conditions are becoming more and more common. Uh, I was quite blown away a little bit by the numbers. Um, I just, they were higher than I would have expected. Uh, I mean, this is a whole generation that is going to grow up with an entirely different uh, level of confidence, I think, in, in, in the future. For the students that I'm teaching, what used to be referred to as the standard work model, i.e. the nine to five day with prospects of promotion and retirement, does not exist. I might as well be, you know, been telling them about the standard work model on Mars. There's often a stereotype about people who are living in poverty or who are having the challenges of work. I'm a 50 year old white guy um, and it happens to me. I'm, a, I'm what's considered a white collar worker, um, but this is happening more and more everywhere. As, not just one specific policy, it's uh, the nature of work is changing. Veteran journalist Hank Denisowski covered labor and unemployment trends for the London Free Press for nearly 20 years. He recalls the devastating impact of the 2008 US recession that left London with Canada's second highest unemployment rate. London was more dependent on the Amer overall American economy than any other city in North America. And that includes the American cities. We, it, it just a quirk of, because of the way our manufacturing works, because of the way our exports work. And the US economy got hammered in 2007, as we all know, because of the housing crisis. It, the tremendous uh, loss of unemployment. And disproportionately, that impacted London. Ontario in general took a big hit, but obviously we took a much bigger hit here in London. It was really devastating. For a while there, there were so many plant closings and layoffs and that sort of thing that we joked about having a scoreboard at the top of the business page every day. You know, <laughs> what, what we lost today, you know, because it got to be sort of a, a, a grim joke. The Ford assembly plant near St. Thomas, which is 3,000 jobs, uh, the Kellogg's uh, cereal plant, the electromotive diesel plant, all those jobs have disappeared in the last, uh, you know, 10, 12 years. And these were good uh, unionized jobs paying, you know, $30, $35 an hour, very good pensions, very good benefits. While the good news is that unemployment for the London region is now down to pre-recession levels, our city has lost 5,400 full-time jobs since 2005. During this time, London's population has also grown by about 7% since the recession but we've seen virtually no growth in employment. London has the largest proportion of working age people, sort of 25 to 54 prime working age, that are not working, 25%. And that's higher than any other 
uh, large city in Canada. Sure, there's been a lot of new industries come in, especially tech industries are popping up all over, but they're not the same kind of jobs. They tend to appeal to 20-somethings, uh, people who maybe haven't started a family yet. A lot of them are short-term contract jobs, you know, gig employment as they call it. The very phrase, the gig economy, today that term is, is applied to a whole range of insecure, part-time, temporary, self-employed work. We haven't ever really replaced those, those good full-time jobs uh, in the manufacturing sector that we, that we once had. And I think this is why London is sort of rates so poorly in terms of the number of people who have precarious employment and, uh, or aren't working at all. Stuart was let go from his full-time IT job, and since then, he has struggled finding anything other than short-term contract positions. It was 2011, 2012. London was still coming out a little bit out of, out of the recession at the end of the last decade. Very different landscape, especially as a mid-40s person. Um, a lot of differences out there and also a lot more competition, I discovered. How does this kind of job market affect those living in poverty in London? The LPRC's research showed that precarious employed individuals are more likely to experience dissatisfaction with their jobs, depression, anger, and lower levels of self-reported health. We talked to Londoners who are experiencing these impacts in their day-to-day -day life. Since arriving in Canada with his family in 2005, Francis Hanna has been dedicated to his goal of working in public service. The father of four has earned two degrees from Western University and joined several community organizations while working low-paying jobs to help support his family. This summer, Francis finally entered a short-term contract with a nearby municipality. It, it, it just this going January that they decided to pay us like about fourteen dollars an hour, which is the minimum wage. That's what I make. I have two Western degrees and I make fourteen dollars an hour. I'm still, I'm still not relenting. I'm moving forward with every opportunity for training. I'm taking part in it. Every opportunity for volunteerism, I'm taking part in it. I thought by now things would have changed around, you know, income wise. We are barely surviving. It's sickening, you know, and that's why I've, I've said the syndrome that I have developed in this one and that anybody in that country to, to, to have that syndrome is called unemployed development syndrome. Because it, you're unemployed and then that, that syndrome is on you, way on your head, you know. Healthcare worker and single parent Jennifer Vale is no stranger to struggles of unstable employment and surviving increments of poverty. You can get the work if you can take the work. So when you're a mom, a single parent, and you're, you know, um, they call you in for a day shift that starts at seven o'clock and they call you at five, like, like unless you have a partner at home or a live-in babysitter, you know, you can't just up and go. You can't say, yes, I'm going to take that shift. Right. Maybe my max income in a month was like $1,000. The stress of not having money, um, like that's really, really hard. Um, the stress of not being able to, it's not just buy your kids stuff, it's just the stuff that lets you participate in life. You don't have a social life, and you don't have a social life for them. And, uh, and that's, that's very, very isolating as a parent. As a family, it's isolating. Precarious work also has effects on personal relationships. One in three Londoners felt the job uncertainty impacted their ability to do things with friends and family. 72% of precarious workers in London say it has negatively affected their family's quality of life. Mary Lawrence recently made the tough decision to quit her hard-earned job at an out-of-town group home because of low pay, shift work, and unpredictable hours. Two hours of my five-hour shift would be put into gas just to get back and forth. Um, it wasn't feasible. For a five-hour shift, I'd bring home maybe 40 bucks if I was lucky. So I got told more than once, if you refuse to do this, you're going to be fired. Um, and it was things, like I'm not trained as a personal support worker and I had to change diapers and clean up urine, change catheters. I shouldn't be doing that. I've never been trained to do that. Um, when, I, when I pointed that out to my boss, I literally got told, do it or be fired. 
I asked for a raise multiple times and they never gave me one. I asked for better shifts. I was promised better shifts, never received them. It came to a point where it was going to be a bubble that would burst. So I, I ended up quitting my job and got back on Ontario Works to be able to get some assistance and kind of figure out how to pay these bills down. I am still technically better off financially being at home on Ontario Works than driving back and forth to Strathroy every day. After being off work for cancer treatments, Andrew Glenn was let go from his property management job 10 years ago. Since that time, the married father has had second career training and several jobs doing contract and seasonal work, which has taken a toll on his mental health and well-being. Yeah, I think in London the situation has definitely taken a turn for the worse. So, I mean, if you already have a, an unemployment market like that, I think it, the competition just increases. And so how does that, how does, you know, your situation is even worse if you're competing against uh, healthy people? I mean, I could safely say in the past three or four years that I've probably applied for close to two or 300 jobs in London. You reach a point where, you know, um, you know, you can you can only take so many rejections, or you can you can only send out so many resumes and so many cover letters, and you can only apply for so many jobs before you start thinking to yourself, like, is this is this ever going to end? So I've had a long history of precarious employment, um, especially in the past couple years. I, I've never actually been contracted, like you know, temporary contracts or whatever. It's just been precariously from job to job to job. And they've lasted from anywhere from one month to four months. Most of my most of my employment has been part time, but I've been working near full time hours. At some part time jobs, they'll you know expect you to work hours that are just below full time hours instead of just paying you full time wages. They're paying you part time wages, but they're expect like they're expecting you to work like one hour under what would be con considered full time work. Due to a chronic pain condition, Marshall is unable to work physically demanding jobs. But his contract job at a local nonprofit is able to accommodate him. Although it is um, a stumbling block, it's not what I would consider a barrier. I can still do things, people are still allowing me opportunities. I see a, a number of people on the street with similar conditions to mine. Although they used to try to better themselves, I can see exactly how it is that they don't put themselves out anymore because there's acceptance on a personal level, but there's not a lot of acceptance inside people's business models that they have to allow for employees that aren't as predictable. It's so ingrained in society, that the way businesses think. It's like, no, you have to maximize the potential of all your employees. We need maximum efficiency, we want maximum production. My view of the world is we're all on this planet together, and if a person can contribute a little bit, I think that should be encouraged. Companies, yes, companies are in business to make money, but they're also in business to serve their customers, help their employees, help the community. Mm -hmm. And we've lost those last two. Do our best, especially my wife, should do our best to make sure our kids have their needs. I said, Daddy's going to buy it. Don't worry about it. We'll get there. I'll buy it. I'm certified to work in this country. It's only a matter of time. I'll work, I'll make good money and you'll get your need. So we have that conversation. I, so I was working uh, part-time in, in the nursing home, so I had no benefits and like very little money, and I was living in a subsidized townhouse, and he had pneumonia. And then I remember going to the only 24-hour shopper's drug mart and getting the prescription filled, and the pharmacist just saying like, your benefits don't cover this. This is $120. Do you have $120? I remember as a mother feeling like I had just done such a disservice to my son for being who I am and where I am. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's poverty. Those are, the, you know, that's what it looks like. It's anxiety provoking, you know, not having money. Like people say, oh, money isn't, you know, can't, what's it? Money can't buy you happiness? Well, like I, I think food in the fridge 
and, and shelter, those, those things buy happiness and money that costs money. Ontario Works is pretty invasive. They just, they make you feel very shameful. Um, when I applied, there was one thing she said to me that really resonated with me. She said, well, why didn't you prepare for a rainy day? <laughs> and I just, like I said to her, how do you prepare for a rainy day when you're not making enough to make ends meet as it is? If you've never lived a day in poverty, you're not gonna understand what it's like. I work, I work extra hard every day just to make the ends meet, just to get dinner on the table every night. When I get a bad day and it hits me, um, it's pretty debilitating sometimes, right? It's like I am a strong person, but everybody has their breaking point. Um, and I, I yeah, I, there's days where I break. I want to go back to school, I get a proper education, and then hopefully at some point find a regular nine to five job where I can be at home every night with my kids and you know cook dinner for them, do their homework with them. You don't realize how much you miss those things. Um, and how much they miss those things when you're not around. I've had times where like I've made too much to qualify for OW and then I'll lose my job in between that period so I'm literally going a month or two without any income coming in. That transition from having that kind of extra money from working to going back to what isn't minimum wage, <laughs> it, that transition has been difficult. It's very discouraging when you're precariously employed for such a long t term of time. When you when you look at romantic relationships, like if you're constantly precariously employed, you're not stable enough for people to be able to trust that, okay, well, if I get in a relationship with you, a long-term relationship with you, then you're gonna be able to contribute. It can actually lead them to feeling like a burden on a lot of their relationships. I got offered, uh, contract pay through Fanshawe College. This job pays enough for my rent, my phone bill, my gym membership, which I don't use, um, food for my kids. Like, And I can think of one negative thing about like not having enough hours or enough money is that um, I, I really like sharing and being generous. And I think that's probably one of the only negative things I can say is like, I wish I had more to give back, you know, so. The government has to realize things have changed. When you look at the comparison, like people talk about you shouldn't be spending any more than 30% of your income on, on housing. Well, we're right now spending over 50. I'm not able to give back, so that's a loss too. And there's lots of other people because we'd love to be able to give back or go to a charity fundraiser, but we can't. So the community in general loses. It's not just an economic, it's an emotional, it's a psychological, the community loses. Where do we go from here? In London, precarious work has an impact on the individual and the community as a whole. Moving forward, how can we build a more resilient and equitable city? We were sort of this fat cat university banking town. And I think there's a real reluctance for the business community in London or the political class to accept that we should be a have-not city, you know, that we should press the French or federal governments for help. Because that would admit that, oh, we're in bad shape. And if you're the president of the Chamber of Commerce or the head of the Economic Development Commission, or if you're the mayor, that doesn't look very good to come out cap in hand and saying, boy, we're, we're in trouble, we need help. It, 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 they tend to fall back onto boosterism that says, you know, we're doing fine, we're doing great, and we're not. I think that that is in fact a way of um, masking um, what has been engineered by, by uh, business, which is a, a massive strategy for labour cost reductions. This is not something that happened by accident. These precarious uh, work conditions are not set in stone. They're something that's been created and they can be uncreated and uh, remade um, with organization and will. I need an employer who's willing to let me work within my limits. I know I can always come here and do something productive where somebody will come up to me afterwards and say thank you and I can do it at my pace without causing myself um, undue repercussions down the road. I think there are 
people out there who understand that people experience, you know, um, really shitty things in life and they'll try to support them and um, give them opportunity. I think that that does exist, but I think that that's hard to come by. And I think that for the individuals that I work with, there are so many barriers to them even getting to the doors of a job. We are a culture that is supposed to work together. We're supposed to care about each other. Why are we ignoring that a neighbor's house is foreclosing? That, you know, why did somebody ignore that I was living in poverty, right? Uh, we need a lot of structural help. We need uh, things like infrastructure projects. We need retraining programs, all that coming from outside. And I don't think anyone, either provincial or federal level, has ever sort of woke up the fact that, oh, they're in trouble, man. They, they, they could use some help down there because even by our own standards, we don't ask for that. We don't recognize our problem. I think it's societal. I think it's systemic. I think that there's a, a whole bunch. And I, I mean, we, I don't think we can have a town hall and fix this because I think it takes so many things. It takes a shift in mindset on all levels in, in, in people who work in, you know, like, a factory, um, making cars, or you know whether it's the mayor, the, there needs to be a shift in mindset. And, and I think that there's still just such a huge stigma that's associated with poverty and how we respond to poverty and the expectations that we have on people who are living in poverty.